Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're so happy to have you here for another webcast of our Korea webinar on Northeast Asia and Korea Peninsula issues. Uh, very happy to have all of you. Doug Bondo is in the house. Welcome, welcome to all of you. Uh, our moderator today is Dr. Michael Jenkins, who's president of the Washington Times Foundation, as well as chairman of Washington Times Holdings, the LLC that owns uh, the Washington Times. Uh, Dr. Jenkins has led a number of well-received fact-finding trips to Korea and Japan over the last few years, since about 2015, that have met with the legislative, executive, intel, and military leadership of the countries, and also the U.S. Uh, presence in those countries. As president of the nonprofit uh, NGO, the Universal Peace Federation International, Dr. Jenkins has decades-long experience uh, in conducting peace initiatives all over the world, particularly in Northeast Asia and the Middle East. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Larry. And thank you for helping us put this program together. Welcome to our audience throughout America and some throughout the world. Uh, today's topic is the global impact of a nuclear arms race. And if we are not successful in the peaceful denuclearization of Korea, of North Korea, and if we're not able to convince Iran to cease its pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability, then the prospect of peace may not be possible. So I would like to introduce our two speakers today, Ambassador Joseph Detrani, and also we're honored to present Mr. William Brown. Ambassador Detrani will speak first. Uh, Joe is the former special envoy for negotiations with North Korea and the director of the National Counter Proliferation Center. He was an associate director of national intelligence and the mission manager for North Korea. He's a veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency and currently a professor at Missouri State University's Graduate Department of Defense and Strategic Studies. We're really honored to present to you Ambassador Joseph Detrani. Welcome, Joe. Oh, thank you, Michael. It's an honor being here. And, and thanks to UPF for hosting this uh, important discussion. You know, uh, given current trends, uh, a global nuclear arms race is more than likely. And that's what I want to talk about briefly this, more, this afternoon. We're talking about more nuclear weapon states with more nuclear weapons and fissile material that's being sought by rogue states and terrorist organizations. And what does this mean? What does that prospect mean if we're looking at this as a, as, as a possibility or an eventuality? The danger of stumbling into accidental nuclear conflict becomes that much more great, becomes that much greater. A terrorist or rogue state acquiring a nuclear weapon or fissile material for a dirty bomb becomes that much more possible. Indeed, that's a challenge to all nations, something we have to, we have to address. And I believe we are addressing it. And I can go back to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty of 1968, where 191 countries signed up to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons technology. And I also, and that's an important piece of it, to cooperate on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and nuclear disarmament. The IAEA was established during this time to monitor this event. So this was, this was seen. And this is why the NPT is there doing its job at the IAEA following uh, to ensure implementation of peaceful disarmament peaceful use of nuclear energy, but also preventing the spread of nuclear weapons and, and weapons technology. I might add also in 2010, former President Obama hosted the first nuclear security summit in Washington, DC. 47 countries participated, 38 heads of state were in attendance at that first meeting with a second meeting in Seoul, a third meeting in The Hague, and a fourth meeting again in DC. And the purpose there was to secure nuclear materials, to address the threat 
of nuclear terrorism. Pieces were put in play to address an issue that we see now in front of us with the possibility of existential threats to all countries if we don't manage it well. I want to cite something before we move on. The recent death of A.Q. Khan. He was a Pakistani nuclear engineer. He was under house arrest in Pakistan. He was the father of Pakistan's nuclear, nuclear weapons program. But this man also was, a, was, a, was a, 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 a nuclear proliferator. This was, this was the scientist, the nuclear engineer who provided Libya, Iran, and North Korea with nuclear weapons technology, manuals, <laughs> training, provided with centrifuges for, if you will, centrifuges for the production of highly enriched uranium for nuclear weapons. Libya walked away from this program. Iran and North Korea persisted. And we see with North Korea, we're talking between 40 and 60 nuclear weapons based on reprocessing spent fuel for plutonium, but also enriching uranium to a purity of 90% or higher for nuclear weapons. So two paths to nuclear weapons in North Korea. Iran pursued a nuclear weapons program until 2003 and ceased. They're now part of the a Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA. Uh, there have been issues with the IAEA and its monitoring access to facilities in Iran. So they are a threshold nuclear weapons state. The US pulled out in 2018, and we're now into negotiations of re-entering the JCPOA. But I submit this, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, if North Korea persists with nuclear weapons and weapons technology, as we see them happening in the last few weeks with the hypersonic launch, uh, with the, with the, with the uh, cruise missile launch, with the launch out of a, a rail car, short-range ballistic missiles, submarine launch ballistic missiles. If we see North Korea persisting and not moving towards, if you will, denuclearization, peaceful denuclearization, it responds for security assurances, a path to normal relations, lifting of sanctions, et cetera. If North Korea is permitted to retain nuclear weapons, there is a good possibility, and I submit there is a real possibility of a nuclear arms race in East Asia, whether it's South Korea, whether it's Japan, other countries, I think they will do the same. And I will say the same for Iran. If Iran should go back to what they were doing prior to 2003, and, and because they, what we see right now, they're using more sophisticated centrifuges to enrich uranium. And if they, if, they, if they should move beyond a threshold country to actually a nuclear weapon state, I would see equally a nuclear arms race in the Middle East, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Turkey, whether it's Saudi Arabia, that's what we're looking at. But let me, let me end on this note also. Al-Qaeda, we remember 9-11, we recently had the anniversary of 9-11, where thousands of innocent people were killed in Washington, in Pennsylvania, and certainly in New York City. Al-Qaeda we knew was pursuing the acquisition of a nuclear weapon or fissile material for dirty bombs. And now what we've seen now is the Taliban back in power in Afghanistan. And hopefully they will not permit as they did it for 9-11, permit Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations to exist on their turf to conduct these terrorist operations. But we have to ensure, as President Obama did in, in 2010 with the first nuclear security summit, we have to secure, ensure that these terrorist organizations do not have access to nuclear weapons or fissile material for dirty bombs. And that is something there. So a nuclear arms race, a nuclear proliferation is an immediate issue affecting the security of all countries. So thank you for having this discussion today on such a relevant, important, timely issue. Thank you, Ambassador Detrani. Uh, always your work has been right at the center of this effort 
to bring peace in Northeast Asia. And uh, we appreciate so much your insights. You're always so detailed and specific. I saw your, your article on the uh, work of Mr. Khan as a proliferator. Uh, it was quite shocking. Uh, and the public really needs to know how aggressive uh, these efforts have been. And we can't even imagine what it would be like if someone like Al Qaeda would get hold of a dirty bomb or, or a, nuclear we a nuclear capability. Our next uh, guest is Mr. William Brown. Mr. Brown chairs the George Washington University's North Korea Economic Forum and the Institute of Korean Studies and is an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service where he teaches occasional courses on the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean economies. He also teaches contemporary China at the University of Maryland Global College. He serves on the board of directors of the Korea Economic Institute of America and writes and is interviewed as a North Korean expert for the Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, the Wall Street Journal, and the Korea Times. He's the principal of his consulting company, North East Asia Economics and Intelligence Advisory, LLC. He retired from a career, a distinguished career in the federal government, and his most recent service was as senior advisor to the National Intelligence Manager for East Asia and the office of the DNI, Director of National Intelligence. Prior to that, his career as an economist and East Asia specialist has included extensive work with the CIA, Commerce, Commerce Department, and the National Intelligence Council, where he served as senior research fellow for East Asia and deputy national intelligence officer for economics. Much of his research is focused on North Korea and also the economies of China and North Korea. Notable papers include Money and Markets in North Korea, an unclassified study for the National Intelligence Council, and a recent paper for, on the economics of Korean unification for the Council of Foreign Relations. We're very honored to present to you at this time, uh, Mr. William Brown. Bill, uh, welcome. Very honored to see you today. Okay, thanks. And uh, I should say at the outset, Joe here is my former boss. So I have to, I'm a little <laughs> bit, in, more than a little bit intimidated. <laughs> um, of course, I agree with everything he says. Um, the only thing I would add, actually, I'll get into my little uh, points, but uh, he didn't mention China. And uh, Joe is a real expert on China. That's where I think his primary expertise lies. So I'd like to hear a little bit more from him on China's role in all this. But uh, my role is uh, much more narrow. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an economist. Um, so I bring uh, the perspective in, of an economist to this issue of North Korea. Um, I have a lot of experience on North Korea and, and South Korea too. In fact, I grew up in South Korea. My, my famous, my most famous story, my best story is my parents. My mom and dad met each other uh, in Pyongyang American High School. Can you imagine that? <laughs> high school, my parents, high school, Pyongyang, the name included American, right? This is back in the 1920s, 30s, uh, when Japan ruled Korea, another world back then. But it's uh, very interesting to look all the way back there and to see the genesis of these programs in North Korea. Um, as an economist, this means um, I try, I, I'm not necessarily successful, but I try to observe and understand incentives as to why North Korea and others do what they do. And sometimes as to why we do what we do. I look at trade-offs, uh, what are the costs and benefits of their nuclear program to themselves, to the North Koreans? Uh, it also means I try to isolate interests of the specific decision makers as narrowly as possible. Why does Kim Jong-un make his decisions? Why does the regime follow through with them? How much does the state of North Korea and the country support these? And are there opposition decision makers? Of course they are, but they're very hard to find. Um, I have about, uh, that's my first point actually, I have about 10 points, I'll make them quick. 
Okay. Uh, most of them are very short. Um, second point is um, North Korea's economy today is in deep trouble. Um, I gave a lecture on it last night at GW. Uh, you can find it on my uh, webpage. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, uh, I think it's in the worst shape that it's been in since the mid 1990s and their, what mm -hmm. they call the arduous march, what we call the great famine. Uh, it's a it's a very uh, difficult time for them right now. Just as uh, Kim Jong, well, you know the the regime Kim looks strong, very strong, but the government and the country, I would say, look very weak. Just as Kim is trying to uh, double down on control that he might be losing. So it's a very interesting time in North Korea. Uh, third point. Um, I fully supported the summitry in 2018. I really liked them. And I wrote a piece before the Ch Singapore summit entitled Cheeseburger, Su Cheeseburger Summit, which I really still like quite a lot. Uh, it's, uh, it's posted in my, in my website. Um, as long as the summit was to be in Pyongyang, as long as it had cooperation of Seoul and Beijing, um, I was in, and as long as the as North Koreans were asking for it, why not have it, right? That was my argument. Um, now, um, um, I even liked to a degree the fire and fury program that preceded that. After all, as Joe was noting, Kim, uh, the North Korean regime was being extravagantly uh, prolific in its nuclear testing including what looked like, what still looks like it might've been a hydrogen bomb type test, a very large explosion in 2017 and, uh, and a um, test launch of a ICBM capable missile. Um, those cried out for a strong response <clears throat> and they got a verbal one from, from Trump. Um, you can argue all day that it wasn't the right kind of tone to it, but it was fire and fury. So I like the double-sided uh, uh, action there, the, the tough response to fire and fury, and then the opening of the door to the summits. I thought that was a, a very uh, a good kind of uh, tactics to use against North Korea. Now, many people here in Washington disagree. And we have to admit, I heard Steve Bagan just the other day, um, you know, obviously the, uh, the last summit in Hanoi did was, I wouldn't call it a failure, but it wasn't a success. Um, and uh, we can talk about that further, why, why that happened that way. My feeling is we didn't quite offer exactly the right set of incentives. To me, it's all about incentives. But the problem, the basic problem is clearly Pyongyang. They have not yet seen it in their interest to denuclearize. Um, uh, fourth, fourth point, Intel people, and a lot of people, but Intel people I like to pick on, because uh, I'm a former Intel person. Intel people always have asked the question, will North Korea give up its nukes? And I've always responded, no, of course not. Why would anybody give up a nuke? Um, the better question is, especially for policymakers, is what would it take for North Korea to trade in its nukes or stop the program? Mm. What mm. would it take? Um, now, maybe there's no set of conditions in which both sides agree. No deal, right? That happens all the time. The house doesn't get sold, no no deal. Um, but I think um, that needs to be tested and tried out constantly. And I think that's what we did in Hanoi. And uh, so far, no deal. We couldn't come to terms with it. But maybe there was some for forward thinking on both sides, I hope so. Fifth, if we really want North Korea to rid itself of nukes, we should raise the cost to them of having them uh, and lower their perceived benefits. Two sides to that equation. Um, I think the sanctions have probably raised the cost of the program to the country. Fire and fury probably lowered their security benefits. Um, so that brought us to the table. Uh, clearly the right combination though has not yet been met. Six. <clears throat> What are the benefits to North Korea or to Kim himself of the nuclear program? Clearly, it's all about security. <clears throat> as long as the nukes make them feel more secure, they'll keep them, no doubt. 
but the opposite can happen as well. <clears throat> they may be able, uh, they may begin to feel that the nukes detract from their security. Um, personally, I think Kim's largest security concern every night uh, must be people in the streets rebelling. I mean, they like to review the videos of Romania, Ceausescu. That is scary for Kim and all the North Korean regime. That to me is a bigger concern to them inside if they really, if we really looked at them than the threat of an American nuclear attack, which for 70 years has not happened. Um, but positive for them for this nuclear security uh, it's pretty clear South Korea is less likely to respond to a provocation or a mistake if North Korea has nukes. So that makes them feel a little bit more secure, I suppose. Um, this could even include a North Korean attack that, you know, provocation, like the Chunan case where they sank that uh, S South Korean Corvette. They didn't have to worry about an attack because uh, our side, South Korean side, is worried about a nuclear response. Um, but, um, um, you know, still, it must be a constant concern for Kim, control of these nuclear weapons inside his own country. And how can he know that we don't know where the, where the nukes are? Maybe we do. Maybe Jeff does. Maybe I do. No, I'm not suggesting I do. But um, from Kim's perspective, worst case in everything, uh, he's got to worry about that, right? He's got to worry his own army, his own military, will let loose with some uh, data, some information. Must be a constant worry for them. <clears throat> Other benefits, though, could accrue from uh, selling the technology. Uh, that's what uh, Joe's group is always constantly worried about. Um, uh, proliferation of North Korean technology proliferated from Pakistan to North Korea. Well, it proliferated, I guess, from the beginning, from us, all right? It's proliferating, <clears throat> kind of like a slow-moving virus all over the world. Um, and somehow it's got to stop. Um, but the, um, uh, it, you know, and they did proliferate to Sirius, but I think beyond doubt, they, they are tried to create a, a Syrian nuclear weapons program. And um, they probably got a bunch of money for doing that. Um, still, it's not that easy to do, and it's highly risky to their security to be doing something like that. I mean, how many enemies can they afford to make? Um, they cannot afford to make China an enemy. And in, most proliferation would go through China. And can you imagine Chinese intercepting a train load with North Korean nuclear material in, inside China? That could be the end of North Korea. So the uh, security concerns for the nukes to me, this is my main point, uh, go both ways. And I think part of our uh, solution here is to raise the cost, raise the um, threat of their own nukes to their own system. That's, I think, where they would uh, bend over and start making to make, we could make some uh, success. Um, the, um, what about the costs to North Korea? They're huge, absolutely monstrous immeasurable perhaps. I would count a million North Korean starvation deaths due to this nuclear program. Um, I'll tell you a little story back in uh, 1984. You know, we should all read that book. It's a great book. Um, but in 1984, down at the old Navy Yard, I was shown an image um, of what we thought, well, I was an economic analyst, of what we thought was an ordinary electric power plant. But it didn't have a transmission yard. And the people, the experts around me told me, uh, you know, this, we opened it, we can look at the construction and we can see it's uh, very close to a copy of a, uh, a plutonium plant in England. The plant uh, in a graphite moderated um, uh, plant uses raw, raw uranium uh, to make plutonium, to get the plutonium rods and then separate the plutonium. Uh, a great fissile material for a nuclear weapon. This is what the English did, and the North Koreans seem to be copying it. This is 1984. I, I point out and I emphasize that date because um, looking at the North Korean economy for so long, that was probably the peak year of its advantage over South Korea. 
maybe two years earlier, maybe about 1980 was about their peak year where they had an advantage, an industrial advantage over South Korea and certainly a conventional military advantage. So 1980-ish around there is their peak year. Ever since then, they've gone straight downhill on the economic side. My point here is that as the nuclear program has succeeded, very slowly, very gradually, but is certainly succeeding, um, the economy has gone into a death spiral. Uh, so you have two divergent lines. Um, the economy I'm talking about here is the state economy, the command economy, the old centrally, excuse me, planned economy. In a way, the breakdown of that state economy has opened the door for an emergent market economy that's sort of taking gradually, slowly taking the place. Um, that's a good thing in, in, a, in a very odd way. To me, the nuclear program is killing North Korea's communism and is creating kind of a vile form of capitalism. I love capitalism, but the form in North Korea is pretty raw. It's pretty unregulated. Un, um, um, uh, can they continue this way? Well, uh, they continued through the famine, the mid-90s, with a huge amount of foreign aid. North Korea is the recipient of huge amounts through its whole existence. Until recently, now they're getting very little aid because of this nuclear program. The only aid that I can discern is crude oil from China, a, li a lifeline that China gives them. Uh, how long can they carry on this way? Well, maybe a long time if people keep giving it aid. Where basically the outside world is afraid of tipping it over and creating a, a huge nightmare. Uh, seventh, seventh point, China, I would call not the elephant in the room, China is the dragon in the room. China would be the main loser, I think, if North Korea, North Korean nukes spawn, as Joe rightfully suggests, a nuclear arms race in East Asia. I mean, just look at South Korea, mostly Japan. I don't, I don't think it would go to Taiwan, but uh, other countries, Vietnam, other countries in Asia, one uh, sort of like dominoes, they start all falling in place. Uh, a big concern in China would be the big loser here. So it's no real um, surprise that China has been on board with our program. I shouldn't call it our program, the world program to stop North Korean denuclearization. Um, so that's, um, uh, that's a sign of, you know, it's one area that we are and have been cooperating with China. It, that might even be a good, good way that we can cooperate in more issues on China. But recently, it's not been going well. Um, the thing is, what people tend to forget is China has this, since 2017, since that big nuclear test, China's been on board with really, really tough sanct trade sanctions on North Korea. There's a lot of spotlighting of the, the uh, smuggling going on. But imagine this. Imagine uh, one day the U.S. Um, says, OK, we're not going to buy anything from Mexico, anything from Canada. Wow, what's going to happen? That's essentially what China did in 2017. We're going to buy nothing from North Korea. Uh, Canada and Mexico would fall apart. There would be incredible smuggling. We would be in bad shape. They would be in terrible shape. Um, so what China has done there is extraordinarily strong. And we got to expect a lot of smuggling to take place. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try to stop it and get Chinese to. But we have to recognize contiguous borders um, too close uh, countries over uh, thousands of years, there's going to be a lot of smuggling taking place. And we have to be careful of uh, fingering China too much that they change their notion. If they change their notion and decided it's okay for North Korea to have nukes uh, and will deal with South Korea and Japan in other ways, wow, we've got a huge problem on our hands. Um, so, uh, hey, what should we do? <laughs> um, you know, I like I love game theory. Economists love to do game theory, but I like to play chess. I like to do play tennis. Um, if you're at loggerheads with the other guy, um, and no progress seems to be possible, it can be advantage advantage to sort of change the game a little bit. Uh, train change your tactics certainly in tennis. Hit a high lob, some something like that, uh, or play uh, <laughs> three dimensional chess. Um, play a different game with them. Um, I'm thinking that's what we've sort of 
not been doing. We've sort of focused so much on this nuclear thing that's not going anywhere. Maybe there's some other games we could play with them. And, and um, North Korea, you know, they call us, call us a hostile country. Well, they're darn right. We are hostile to a lot of their policies. Uh, we should be hostile to their slave slavery, basically. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, that we can't make progress on these other issues while holding the, the, the nuclear issue, not in abeyance, but keeping it uh, from getting worse. Uh, so what do we not like about North Korea? My endless problem with North Korea is its socialist command economy. Stalin put it in in 1945. It's very, it was not a communist country, it was not a socialist country. It had every right to be a, after Japan left, after we liberated the country, it should have been a very vibrant country after that. Stalin came in, put in that socialist system that they've never been able to get rid of. So if we can help it get rid of that socialist system, maybe that's a, it's a plus for both of us. Um, so I'm thinking reform is the right way to deal with North Korea, push, press, insist on reform, and not just from the US, but from South Korea, from China, uh, from everybody. Um, easy said, easy to say, hard to do, but I think there are a lot of little uh, devices that we could be using. And I say in Hanoi, I don't think we use quite the right set of uh, incentives for that. Um, so how can we start this process? <laughs> You know, nothing seems to be happening right now. Maybe it is, but I don't see anything happening. I might suggest giving them a little bit of face just to get it started, get dialogue started, engage. I love the idea of engaging North Korea, um, but I want to engage them with a purpose. And I like to say I engage them with a wrench, you know, a wrench to sort of change things or like a gear in a, in a car, a gear shift, not like uh, marriage engagement. Certainly not like war engagement. We don't need a war there. We don't need to engage in war or marriage. We do need to engage in change. And that's where I think um, some little uh, changes in our trade sanctions might help. Um, you know, our trade sanctions are not, not important on North Korea. So when we offer, we're gonna remove our trade sanctions, uh, Kim should, I should gloss over. Now the China side, that's a whole nother matter, but from us, we have a whole list of uh, economic issues that prevent us from trading with North Korea because it's a command economy. They don't have normal prices. They don't, they're not a member of the WTO. They're not a member of the ILO. They don't pay wages in, in a regular sense. How can we trade with a country that doesn't pay wages correctly, that prices electricity at nothing? <laughs> you, you just can't deal with a country like that without bringing them into the WTO like we did with China. So I think there's a lot of engagement that would be positive for them and positive for us that can happen around this nuclear issue um, that hopefully would convince them that security, uh, you know, that the nukes are making them less secure. And uh, uh, maybe then they start to uh, agree to dismantle them. Anyway, that's enough for me. Maybe, hopefully, I like to be a little provocative. So hopefully I've created a few uh, questions and discussion with Joe, with uh, Mr. Ambassador, I should uh, say. <laughs> Bill, that was great. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Thank well, you, Michael, Bill. Can I start, Michael? Yeah, please, uh, go ahead. Can I just ahead. follow on with some of the Bill? That I thought that was outstanding. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let me just, uh, this is an open discussion. I'm gonna to look to Dr. Jenkins and, and send to you, but uh, some of the points you made, you mentioned China, Bill. You know, uh, look, um, China, uh, we recently had an agreement with the Russian Federation to extend for five years New START. So we are in arms control negotiations with the Russian Federation. We have proposed to China that they be part of these New START arms control negotiations. And China heretofore has said no because of the disparity. We're talking about yeah. a China with maybe 300 plus nuclear weapons uh, to uh, for the United States and the Russian Federation, 1,550 deployed nuclear weapons. Never mind what's in storage, deployed nuclear weapons. However, what we're saying is, if unless we have China into these arms control negotiations, given where China is, I mean, recently we've seen media reports indicating over 250 long-range missile silos 
in, in as many as three different locations in China, which is speaking about a very major uh, uptick in China's focus on, on nuclear weapons and, and, and movement, movement in that direction. So yes, I do agree. We do need to bring China into the equation on arms control negotiations. Uh, and, and, and certainly when we talk about space and where we're all going with space, there are, there are opportunities of, of expanding the, of arms control negotiations to include ensuring that there is no weapons in space. We, we, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of work ahead of us uh, uh, in, in regards to arms control negotiations with the P5 to include the UK and, 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 and certainly uh, uh, France and, and into the, and, into the uh, equation. So there's no question about China being an important part of that. And the last point I'll make, uh, Michael, if I may, on, on Bill's comments about North Korea. Uh, Bill, I do, I do see the US, as you know so well, because you're so, you're so uh, lucid on these issues and, and very conversant with all the particulars. Uh, the US has been, with the Republic of Korea, proposing uh, a package to North Korea, as we did with the six party talks in the September 2005 joint statement, where we're saying, we're talking about a path to normal relations, normalizing our relationship, right. lifting sanctions, security assurances, economic development assistance. So there's no dearth of incentives for North Korea to, for North Korea to join in, in this process of complete verifiable denuclearization. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Bill, I've got, something for you. Joe wrote a very powerful article in the Washington Times two weeks ago, an op-ed, getting North Korea back to the negotiating table. And he talked about the fact that the October 4th uh, reactivation of the cross-border hotline was in part due to President Moon's speech at the United Nations calling for the formal declaration of ending the war. And Joe is suggesting in his op-ed that maybe the end of the war declaration could be uh, a way to open the negotiations once again. And even uh, to my surprise, uh, even the discussion on lifting some sanctions. Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Ending the war and lifting sanctions, what could be done there to, to open up uh, the engagement between the uh, ROK, the US and North Korea? Yeah, you know, I, I keep hearing about this end of war declaration for a couple of years. And now the last few weeks has been very prominent because President Moon is pushing for it late in his administration now. Um, I'm not against it, but I'm not uh, enthralled by it either. Um, it's a piece of paper. To me, there's no war in, in Korea. There never was in theory. You know, it was a police action, right? We never declared war. Of course, there was a very big hot war in 1950-51. But since then, it's been fairly peaceful. The DMZ is a fairly peaceful place, uh, surprisingly so. So this idea of end of war, uh, OK, we can have end of war. But um, we need to think carefully what, um, and you know, I don't buy into a lot of the naysayers who say, oh, that means uh, we would have to withdraw our troops. Oh, no, why, why would that happen? You know, we're not, we're not going to be pasted by the North Koreans that way. So a lot of the arguments to and fro, I think, are kind of disingenuous. Um, but I don't, the problem is I don't really see, see it as a North Korean initiative. If I, if I saw Pyongyang really pushing for this and thinking, well, okay, maybe we can get some leverage from this. Why do they want it? But if this is really coming out of South Korea, it seems to me, and it's evident why they want it or why again, looking at personalities rather than uh, countries or, or, or regimes, it's pretty evident why President Moon wants it. He's about to leave power and he wants a good legacy. This would help do that. And maybe we would want to help him do that. But um, I don't know. I'm just not uh, thinking that it would solve any, any important problems. I do like the idea, though, of looking for something to get some kind of hook to get the engagement back on track. I'm not just, I'm just not sure that's the right hook. Joe, does the Biden administration really want to open up negotiations or are they not ready for it? Or it seems like they're not really putting it on the front burner. 
what it, what's your thoughts on that? And I like what Bill said, trade your nuclear weapons in for something rather than just give them up. I think that, so two parts to this question is, is Biden administration ready to engage? Do they really want to engage? And, and second part would be, is Kim Jong-un's motivation to get economic development and get free from just being, you know, pretty much dominated by the by China. Is his motivation strong enough that an economic development that would really be significant, could it really lead him into a more balanced relationship with all the, uh, uh, with the United States and ROK? No, I think those are excellent questions, Michael. Thank you for asking those questions. I, I think the Biden administration is very serious about uh, engaging with North Korea and finding a peaceful resolution to these issues. I, I, I think also the Biden administration, my sense is uh, not being part of this administration, is they don't want to be sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, used in any way. They don't want to be somewhat uh, reactive to, uh, to, uh, to uh, 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 actions taken by the DPRK uh, that would generate a response from the U.S. So I, I think what they're saying is let's look at a level playing field. We want to sit down and talk. You can put any issue you want on the table. Uh, you say we're hostile, put all the issues on the table. We will tell you what's available to you if you prepare to, uh, as Bill said, uh, trade your nukes for normal relations, the lifting of sanctions, economic development assistance to your question, Michael, uh, and, and other deliverables to you. The U.S. is prepared to do that. So, But I, I don't think the U.S. wants to show, I th my sense is the Biden administration, wants to show that, look, uh, you know, we're just, we're, you know, we're just re reacting to every move that North Korea makes. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and, and, and secondly, I don't think anyone wants to show that uh, any element on their part from the DPRK to, to uh, uh, if you will, escalate tension and, and, and try to intimidate will then result in a deliverable whereby the US uh, responds by saying, well, we'll give you something. So in that, in that context, I've heard from colleagues that have said, Joe, we have to be careful about uh, uh, an end of war declaration. We don't want to be seen as we're giving them something because they're, they're, they've uh, escalated tension and they're somewhat intimidating and, and they're getting something in return for that, that type of behavior. I submit, however, uh, an end of war declaration is a gesture. That's all it is, a gesture. Yeah. It's to build some trust. It's to say we're prepared okay. to move forward. Look, yeah. Michael, we can't, to have a peace treaty, we need the consent and the approval of the Senate. This is a big process. Yeah. It's going to include a lot. So I think it is a path to, uh, to building some sort of trust that's really not present as we speak. Thank you. One more question, Bill, and then I'd like to let you and Joe just have a further discussion. But one more question is, it's pretty clear to everybody that China does not want North Korea to be a nuclear uh, weapons state, a nuclear power with capability with ICBMs and so forth. Uh, and yet, also, I don't think that from what I understand, China wants to see uh, North Korea develop economically with a strong partnership with the ROK and the United States. Can you comment on that? They don't want a nuclear state in North Korea, but they also don't want to lose North Korea as their buffer. So how yeah. can we work that out with China? Yeah, I, I, I agree. But again, sir, I, I have a hard time thinking of China in a monolithic sense. Um, China's an enormous place with a lot of different actors. We all talk. We all know and talk about Xi Jinping, but um, there, there's six others on his Politburo, and there are there, you know, there's so many interests in China, and uh, I can't begin to you know, try to teach this course on it. It's just bewildering all the different uh, actors. Um, it's hard enough looking at Washington. Man, China is uh, ten times more complicated. So uh, I'm sure there are plenty in North in China who love North Korea's nuclear weapons. Why? Because they keep us on edge, you know. Um, but then there are plenty of others who think, no, this is dangerous. Uh, Japan might get nuclear weapons. So uh, trying to 
figure out who's on what, where in China is very, very difficult. Um, it is uh, a, a troublesome angle to China though. This is what I would say to Chinese people is that look, uh, you've helped North Korea move to this incredibly impoverished state. You really haven't helped them. Um, it's, um, you saved them in the Korean War at huge cost to you. And what has come of that? Not much. So North Korea is in a way their responsibility. It's mainly Stalin's responsibility, but Stalin is long dead and gone as is the Soviet Union. So now I think China has to be more responsible for the state of play in North Korea. And that's including hunger and all the bad human rights and all that. Um, I think plenty of Chinese would go along with that. Many Chinese I've talked to quite agree with that. And uh, they sort of think they're helping North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, they are providing crude oil. But, um, and, uh, you know, the crude oil part, I used to object to that. Why are you giving crude oil to North Korea? Why don't you at least sell it to them? But I'm thinking now that the crude oil is kind of China's last lever against a major provocation. And we have to also should remember uh, since the um, big button, little button, remember all that? The fire and fury business. You cannot have an uh, ICBM, that, all that talk. Uh, well, North Korea has not done another nuclear test and it's not done an ICBM test. This is what's going on, what, uh, three or four years now. So there is some something that's holding them back, yes. I think, otherwise. Be, and I think it's China's crude oil is a big part of that. My guess is, remember, uh, uh, Kim hadn't gone out of North Korea when he gets this fire and fury going. He goes to Beijing very quickly. I expect uh, uh, Xi Jinping said something like, OK, no more nuke tests and we'll keep your oil going. Right. Something mm. a bargain like that. And it seems to be kind of working. So I'm, uh, I'm not, th I think China has not bailed on this nuclear issue yet, but I am worried that it could if we keep up all this contention between the US and China. Thank you, Bill. I I'd like to give you both one question and then our tech team, if you could just take me off the screen and let's let Bill and Joe uh, discuss this further. But the question goes back to our topic for today, proliferation. Um, if North Korea gets to the point of no return where they've locked in their nuclear power and they have their arsenal and they have the capability to strike the United States and so forth, um, then what happens with the other countries? How this proliferation, how fast will Japan and ROK be determined or, you know, asking to or seeking to develop their nuclear weapons? How, how does proliferation work? And that's in that scenario. So, EJ, you can take me right off the screen and let's let uh, Bill and, and Joe really discuss towards the end of the program. So, Thank you. Let, so, so, Michael, uh, let me just say um, one of the major concerns with North Korea's nuclear program, and Bill mentioned this with the Syria, is the, uh, the uh, proliferation issue. Uh, the, what, what North Korea did uh, with uh, Syria, and as we all know, is, Israel uh, in uh, September of 2007 took out that facility in Al Kabar, Syria. This was a nuclear reactor similar to the uh, five uh, megawatt reactor, the uh, graphite moderated reactor at uh, Yongbyon. Uh, uh, if the Israelis didn't take out that reactor in September of 2007, it's quite. <laughs> It's, it's more than likely that, uh, you know, uh, a Syria that used chemical weapons against its own people, uh, as we saw in 2012-13, uh, would have nuclear weapons. And that's, that's scary when you think about it. So, so North Korea in, uh, was, even though we were negotiating with them uh, with the six-party talks and before that with the agreed framework, uh, they were providing uh, uh, Syria with a nuclear technology and training and know-how and equipment. Uh, that is, so the proliferation issue with North Korea, retaining nuclear weapons is, is whether it's uh, sanctioned at the state level or whether it's illegally acquired, because that's one of our major concern with highly enriched uranium, that there are bad actors out there who may want to be selling this material 
to terrorist organizations and other uh, uh, bad actors uh, who would use it against, if you will, uh, the, uh, uh, the people in the world uh, and, and, and uh, all nations. So we're all very vulnerable in this regard. But North Korea retaining nuclear weapons, because I hear from so many people about why don't we get into arms control negotiations and so forth. No, we're not talking about arms control, we're talking about denuclearization, complete verifiable. And this is a package we've, we've offered to North Korea. They said they were interested, Kim Il-sung said it in 1994, Kim, Kim Jong-il said it in 2005 and 2006, and Kim Jong-un said it in 2018, as Bill indicated in the Singapore summit with the president, former President Donald Trump. This is where we are, because I do believe Japan and, and certainly South Korea, I hear from South Korean friends and former colleagues. Joe, you got to understand, even though the US has extended deterrence commitments to South Korea and Japan, we will have to look at our own capabilities to defend ourselves. And, you know, and, and some people see the US as sometimes as being very fickle. I go back to 1962 with John F. Kennedy and, and, and the goal where the goal told President John F. Kennedy, thank you very much for the nuclear umbrella, but we'll have to have our own nuclear capabilities to defend ourselves. So I believe proliferation, the, a nuclear arms race in East Asia is, <clears throat> is a reality in addition to the significant proliferation problems. Over to you, Bill. No, I, I, I quite agree. And um, I heard uh, a prominent South Korean person just a couple of weeks ago, I won't say the person's name, but saying, um, uh, yeah, we've got to think about nukes. Um, it's kind of similar. Remember, uh, President Trump got scalded by Washington when he mentioned, oh, South Korea and Japan might go new. Anyway, it's sort of a casual comment, probably not a, not a useful comment that he made, but it's kind of a reality uh, that at least, well, according to the South Korean person, uh, at least we need to be talking about it because whether we do it or not, talking about it is kind of a deterrence. It's sort of affecting China. Mm -hmm. China needs to understand their implications to North Korean nukes that go beyond North Korea. And so I think the discussion is very worthwhile. Um, whether South Korea or Japan would actually go there or not, again, I put on my economist hat, start looking at it and the pluses and minuses, um, uh, you know, they might very well go against that decision. South Korea, for example, might lose its nuclear uh, electric power capability. It loves to export nuclear power equipment and other countries might, they might have, you know, how it dealt with the IAEA and the NPT would be problematic for South Korea. And Japan has a very negative attitude toward nukes for obvious reasons. So mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not clear to me that they would go nuclear, but it's certainly useful for North Korea and for China and for Russia to think, oh, they might go nuclear. What, where would that take us? So I, I like the conversation. Going back though uh, to something that um, uh, Mr. Ambassador Detrani mentioned earlier about the incentives. And this gets very in the weeds, I realize it, and I'm probably too much in the weeds. And I don't wanna sound like I'm pandering to North Korea, but um, I think a lot of the incentives that we've thrown at them are scary to them. When you think, uh, if you're thinking, sitting there in Pyongyang and then you go to Singapore, wow, what a city. You go back to Pyongyang, you go to Hanoi, wow, what a city. You go back, take a long train ride back to Pyongyang, what a dismal place. Um, your, your instinct, I think for them, they're, they're very independently minded. They've always been this way. They wanna do things themselves. The, I've been reading a lot about from the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center Cold War Project. It's fascinating reading the diplomatic traffic from the Russians and East Europeans back in the 19, late 40s and early 50s, all they're talking about a rearranging North Korea's economy, trying to make it a socialist economy. And they're having a lot of trouble. And um, uh, the Soviet ambassador says, look, uh, these Koreans, they just don't take our advice. They don't want to engage with us. They want to make their own tractors. They, we will give them tractors. They don't want us to give them tractors. Uh, they want to sell uh, steel. What on earth are they? 
So um, all, all throughout their history, and I think this goes back to their nature, their character, South Korea as well, they want to do things on their own. So when our incentive structure is like foreign direct investment there, Samsung is going to come down in there and rebuild your, electric, your uh, cell phones. Oh my gosh, that's the last thing they want to hear. They're afraid to death of a company like Samsung. And they should be. Samsung would eat them alive, right? So I think the incentive structure has to be much more cleverly and actually usefully designed to promote internal North Korean growth. Very much exactly, I would say, like we promoted in South Korea in the early 60s. Uh, I won't go into that here, but uh, North Korea looks a lot like South Korea did in 1960. We came in, Park Chung-hee government came in and really changed that economy on a dime, basically by creating a decent money and banking system. And we converted commodity aid into balance of payment support, gave them export markets, everything changed in South Korea. I think it's that kind of messaging to North Korea that we can help you do what you want to do yourself. And most importantly, we can do this and you can be independent of China. That's and independent of South Korea. That might be a good a little bit more troublesome. But um I, I think it's these incentives need to be more carefully thought out. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, thank you. I have uh, uh, Dr. Jenkins here on uh, cell phone because he got bounced out, and so did so did Ambassador Detrani. Looks like uh, thank Michael, you. are you thank there? Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Bill. This has been a most excellent session. Uh, we have a technical issue. Joe and I both were dropped off somehow, but we're going to conclude here. I'd like you to give any final remarks that you have, and Joe, if you're back go ahead and give your final remarks, but I want to thank our audience for this wonderful program. We're learning so much. Bill, we want to have you back again. There's so much to discuss and so many angles here, uh, but the one final point is uh, for how much of the Korean economy, North Korean economy, how much, do, what percentage of their economy comes from the sale of, uh, of nuclear technology? Is there a number you know uh, that uh, percentage that you know about that, or are they still as active in, in selling nuclear technology to Africa, to uh, the Middle East? And you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have ac access to classified information, and that's where that would lie. But my um, instinct is to think that there's very little right now. And in fact, in the past, we mentioned the Syrian bit and the Pakistan, a lot of trade, missile trade with Pakistan. One thing that's uh, happened is this closure, this red, we didn't talk much about it. North Korea has closed its borders. China has kind of closed its borders. So there's very little people movement in and out of North Korea right now. Very little, it's amazing. No trade and almost no people movement. And that's gotta be, uh, it doesn't hurt the hacking business. You know, it's all over the, over the internet, whatever. But something like nuclear materials, I think it's very hard. And uh, we, don't, we don't see ships coming out very much. We used to be able to track ships. Uh, I don't, I think it's less, that part of it is less of a worry right now, I think, but then I'm not in the uh, intelligence business right now. Thank as, you, Bill. As to, as, uh, Ambassador to Trump. And Larry, I'd like to turn it over to you for uh, our uh, invitation for next week's Washington okay. Brief. Okay. Thank, Thank you everybody for a great program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, Ambassador Detrani just texted. He's uh, he got uh, they lost electricity out in Great Falls. <laughs> so he was knocked not just into internet purgatory, but uh, out of the so, uh, out of the ballpark. So that means he must be in North Korea right as we speak, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Uh, maybe the CCP did it. Uh, I want to let you know that next week is uh, Washington Brief. It's our monthly uh, webcast. Our guest will be Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, who is also another former, oh, maybe not a, not a boss of, of Bill Brown, but actually as a member of the Board of Directors uh, of the uh, Korean Economic Institute of America. You're kind of close to her boss, but she is the executive director and uh, uh, former 
U.S. ambassador to Korea and uh, uh, just an excellent guest. And we're really looking forward to that. And that'll be next week, next Tuesday, November 2nd, election day. So go vote and then come back and, and, uh, and watch the Washington Brief from 2 to 3 p.m. So Larry, Thank let you me all just very say, much. Larry, let me just say goodbye to everybody also. I was off, the electricity went off in Great Falls, Virginia. So thanks for the session and appreciate the conversation, Bill. Yes, right, thanks. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so Thank much. You, Larry. Thank you, Ambassador okay. to Trump. Thank you, Michael. And, and he's back, he's back. It was electricity, he's back. Back, okay. electricity, he's back. I love right. you from Pakistan. All, all wells that ends well. We will uh, see you, you all next it, week. That's it, you got it, man, you got it. Goodbye. Goodbye.